So Revelation 22, verse 2. Let me start off by reading that. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Have you ever wondered why trees have leaves at all? Are they there just there for looking pretty or for, for blossoms? Or do they actually have a function as part of the integral procedure that God built the tree and created the tree within? You see, trees have leaves to keep them alive. Can uh, a tree live without leaves? No. Can a tree live without a root system? No. Can it live without a trunk? Obviously not. The root system would die. There wouldn't be any leaves, no branches, no nothing going on with it. But the leaves have a very integral part that they play. And if you go back to, I don't know, grade three or grade four or grade five, talking about photosynthesis. And what the leaf does is it, it absorbs sunlight takes that sunlight, using that energy, it produces a sugar or sap from which it feeds the entirety of the tree. And they also contain plastids, which handle the energy conversion process of the sun, S-U-N. But leaves are important. It also helps the tree to breathe. It helps it to cool down. The tree pulls in, what, carbon dioxide, and it releases an oxygen. Again, there's a conversion process that happens. Everything that God has done over time, he had never missed a mark with the whole thing. And that's why when they go back, you go back and you look in Scripture, a lot of times it's related to things of agriculture, the very basic essentials of life. And we can look at this tree, we can look at the river, we can look at all the necessities that are, that are important for growth. So what about roots? We're not going to get into roots too much today. We're not even going to talk about the leaves too much today. But roots are the, the highway that the minerals or the, and the waters can be transported from the soil up into the tree, and it absorbs it up and takes it in. It also stores nutrients, stores the riches. It's held within the root, and then it releases those riches when it, what? Sometimes there's a time of drought, and it releases those riches Sometimes the word is nigh. It's at those times where you have that root base and it releases that into your vine process. The tree also anchors. It's a foundation. And it also has everything to do with the vegetative reproduction of the tree. It has pulling on all that competition because roots will fight for space with other plants. And only the strong survive out of that. And that's where we are. We are the strong. We are the survivors. We have the power. And that's where we're going with this today. Genesis 3, verse 12. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Again, I'll read Revelation 22 to tie into that. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, the million-dollar question, we just went from Gen Genesis all the way to Revelation. What happened between these two verses in relation to the topic? Somewhere along the line, idolatry was dealt with. Id idolatry was driven out. We got one tree, one tree equaling 12 fruits producing, 12 months producing, 12 tribes producing, 12 disciples producing. All under what? One. See, leaves have that healing property, but everything we're talking about here is about producing, producing, producing. And you get into the description there, it talks about the lunar cycle, every month. Month is moons. And you're getting into the lunar cycle. And that's why the things like new moon are so important. And the Father says what? Keep it. You see, these aren't nouns that we're talking about here. 
Everything is a verb. Everything is an action. Everything is about producing, 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 generating, generating, gener generating. All from what? The energy of the Father. The power of the living God. The anointing. So let's jump over to Deuteronomy 33, verse 13. 33, verse 13. Because we've got to understand who we are in this whole process. And a lot of people understand this, but there's a lot of people out here who do not understand this, which was very relevant this week. In regards to Joseph, talking about the final blessing to, that Moses put on, upon Israel. And of Joseph, he said, blessed of the Lord in his, in his land, with the precious things in heaven, with the dew and the deep lying beneath. You can keep your finger in Deuteronomy 33 because we're going to flip back and we're going to break this apart a little bit today. With the precious things of heaven, with the dew and the deep lying beneath, with the precious fruits of the sun, with the precious produce of its months. Again, lunar cycles. Months. Actually, in the King James Version, it does say moons in there, but it's referring to lunar cycles. It's a process. It's an ongoing thing. It continues over and over and over and over and produces every month, produces every month. Deuteronomy 33, verse 15. With the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of the everlasting hills, with the precious things of the earth, this is the blessing, with the precious things of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwells in the bush, let the blessing come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers. His glory is like a firstborn bull and his horns like the horns of the wild ox. We're going to break this down and get into that. Together with them, he shall punish the people to the ends of the earth. Shall push, sorry. Shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are thousands of Manasseh. In 17, though, it talks about, I'm going to jump back and forth around between 15, 16, 17, and kind of break this down a little bit. Let's look at this. You talk about his firstborn bull. That is what has everything to do with a majesty and who we are in the Father's eyes. His horns are the horns of a wild bull. For what? Because if you go right back to it, with them he shall gore the peoples. That's what it, you break it down, and that's what it gets back into. We are a raging bull. Why do you think they probably have the raging bull? Wall Street, all that stuff. Thieves steal the things of the Father, put their own little twist on it. That's us. That's who we are. We are the raging bull. We will push people to the, to the edges of the earth. We will bring in the, the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands in Manasseh. You see, but you go through this scripture here, the, go through Deuteronomy 33, you can see that this blessing here to Joseph is longer than all the other ones except for Levi. But that keeps right up. It stays in conjunction. It's tied right in and consistent even with the blessing that was put upon them by Jacob. Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful plant. What are we talking about? We started off talking about the tree of life here. Joseph is a fruitful plant. A fruitful plant by a spring, Genesis 49, 22, with branches climbing over the, the wall. The archers attack him fiercely, shooting him, and pressing him hard. But his bow remained taut, and his arms were made nimble by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob from there, from the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your fathers, who will help you. By El Shaddai, who will bless you with a blessing from heaven above, blessings from the deep, lying below, blessed from the breast and the womb. The blessings of your father are now more powerful than the blessings of my parents, 
extending to the farthest part of the everlasting hills. They will be on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. You see, the passage here is in no reference, the older passage is in no reference to Ephraim and and Manasseh. It doesn't speak of them. But we're mentioned here, however, and then it goes off and Moses breaks it down further. But you can see that the tribe of Joseph, it starts to split into Ephraim and Manasseh at that point in time into its two separate parts. And somewhere at a later date, we can know that Scripture talks about everything coming back together. Under who? One tree, one trunk, the Father Almighty Himself. You see, but let's go back to Deuteronomy and the, and the blessing here from Moses. Because it relates to two absolute spheres of life that we operate in. It talks about their material prosperity from the produce of the land. And it also talks there about their their might against foreign nations. Military might as the raging bull and who we are. You see, that material prosperity that would come upon the tribe is described in a series here, a series of images, and that they absolutely come to their fullness when we get into Deuteronomy 33, verse 16. The fullness of it. When it says, with the best from the earth and with all that fills it. That's the blessing put upon us. We have it all, is the point I'm trying to get at, with everything. He has given it to us all if we just learn to take it. But it's the best. The best. You're the best. It literally talks here, and it's literally broken down to, you are the choice fruits. And He's given us the excellent things, the best from all the earth and all that fulfills it. It's literally the choice fruits, the excellent things, the best from the heavens, the best that the Father has, the best rains, the best dew, the best nutrients. Because we have the Father. Because the deep lying beneath of what's going on with this whole thing as there's a whole subterrain of waters which were believed to be the source of the springs, the rivers which turned the water and watered the land and contributed to its production. I'm not going to get into too much of the stuff below today, but you'll understand it by the last set of scriptures that I read today. You see, but we have the produce. Produce? Produce, we have to do both. You have to have what the Father has in store and partake of what the Father has has in store and produce what the Father has in store. But when you break things down to the basic elements, the produce of the sun to yield the months, the lunar cycle, refer to the crops, the best crops that would be nurtured by the sun, S-U-N, through the S-O-N in our, our lives. And they would come to full fruition at different seasons of the year. Always continually producing, 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 producing. And you look at wealth it talks about there because what with the best from the earth and all, all that fills it. Talked about there when we read it, the whole, the whole thing in, in Deuteronomy there the wealth of the ancient mountains and the everlasting hills. The everlasting hills. It's like a forest that's growing so densely on a mountain we can just reach up and just walk through it, partake of it. It's about prosperity. And this isn't a prosperity message, but you have the power through the Almighty God to be the most prosperous on the face of the earth. We have it. We have everything. He's given it to us. And all we have to do is walk in it. You see, but when you talk about prosperity that's talked about here, the prosperity here is provided by by nature. Deuteronomy 13, 13, 16 again. The earth and its fullness. But then immediately 
it reverts right out of that and points the finger right unto the source. The source, the source of the wealth of the natural world, the one who dwells in the bush he was talking about. It's what it says. The one who dwells in the bush. Talking about the burning bush and the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. It relates back to that encounter that Moses had at that point in time. The encounter that was so great during the time of the, times of the Exodus. And it happened then. And he spoke that unto Joseph then. And it's for us, for the future. And now is the future. The blessings are upon us. It's God's promise. It's God's promise to us if we receive His promise. I'm sure we all want our hand up first on that one. You see Deuteronomy 13, verse 17. There's a reference here to two tribes, though. Ephraim and Manasseh, to which the tribe of Joseph was beginning to have some type of a, a divide. Not so much in a negative way, so that it could expand out. But you look at it and you read it through there, Ephraim is the one that's given prominence in the whole situation. Ephraim is. With the blessing. Why? What about the firstborn? You see, you look at the, the, the firstborn was Manasseh. But because Jacob's reversal, when he crossed his hands and blessed the two sons, the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim took precedent at that point in time. It's dramatic. And it's pointed out again here. You see, you look at the, the, the way that it's just written. You know, we say, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20. That's the natural progression. But here it even talks about the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. It's still reversed as it's written here again, just to reinforce what God has truly set up for now. Genesis 3.24 So he drove the man out and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep way of the tree of life. We read in Revelation that it's there. We can see that it's being partaken of. We have access to it. So what happened to the cherubims? Where did they go? Why weren't they needed anymore? So let's look at some of the cherubim examples and what the, ch the job of a, a cherubim is. Exodus 25, verse 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I give thee in commandments unto the children of Israel. You see, we have to realize that God came out of the ark. Went out of the ark and he came into the heart of man. Into our hearts. Those who accept his son, his word, his written word, his living word. Which makes that ark really these days nothing more than a very valuable relic. The power is not in the ark. The power of God resides within you. Within us. To utilize, to produce Leviticus 16, verse 1. Let's look at a little bit more of these cherubims. Adonai spoke with Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons when they tried to sacrifice before Adonai and died. They just couldn't do it God's way there, could they? Adonai said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron not to come at any time into the holy place beyond the curtain in front of the ark, which is on the ark, so that he will not die because I appear in the cloud over the ark cover. Over the ark cover. 
It's the presence of the Almighty God is what was going on there. Now the presence of the Almighty God resides within you now. Resides within us. And we have the, the, the power through the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It cuts through all human pretense. It reveals the, the true attitude of our heart. It reveals to us so that we can fix things, correct things, take a step forward into His glory, magnify Him, magnify the power of the Almighty God. You see, but you look back at Adam. When Adam screwed things up in the garden, Adam was not just separated. We talked about two points already before. Adam wasn't just separated from the natural garden. He was also separated from spending time with the Father in the spiritual garden where God's presence truly dwelt as well. You see, cherubims almost always serve the capacity of guarding, protecting what belongs to God, or even God's own presence. And here a cherubim is aside to guard the way to the tree of life, where God, what? Was residing. And then God's going to open that up, and we can, what, come into full fruition with Him? Full fruition with Him. That's why we got to thank God for His mercy. His mercy seat. The fact that the cherubims who guarded and shadowed the mercy seat, all, while, all the meanwhile, protecting, 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 so that we could straighten things out. Again, somewhere between Genesis and Revelation, idolatry was taken care of. Idolatry was taken care of. If it's taken care of, hey, it's wide open. But idolatry goes so deep and so far through Scripture. Jump over to 1 Samuel 4, verse 5. And when the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah came into the camp, all Israel shouted with, great, with, with a great shout so that the earth rang, rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of Jehovah was in the camp. Now we jump down to the, the, the 10th verse. 1 Samuel 4, verse 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. What? And they fled every man to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. You see, they were so excited when the ark came into the camp, they, they just thought, oh, we're going to win. We're going to win. We got this thing wrapped up. And what happened? They lost. They're probably sitting back going, what happened? Because they thought that they had God figured out. They thought they had God figured out. Oh, we'll just bring in the ark. We bring in the ark and then God jumps. Oh, I would just want the, the power and then God just has to give it to me. No, it doesn't work like that. And that's not what happened in this case either. You wonder what went through their mind. They sit back. Oh, God's got it. I don't have to do any work. No, we need to put our work boots on. You need to go out there and do the work. We all have to go out there and do the work. It's the calling of God in all of our lives. And you see, what happened with Israel at this point in time, Israel had not repented of their ways. And without true repentance and keeping that repentance and not having to go back and forth and God to God and repenting for the same thing over and over and over. Up here in Canada, we have ice in the winter. It's like getting your car on the ice and then hammering down the gas pedal and you go absolutely nowhere. You have no traction. You slip, you slide, you're out of control. Crashing into things. Repeat, repeat, round and round and round and go nowhere. We need traction. And the way to gain traction is to come in one commune with the Father. Come in right standing with the Father and stay in that right standing with the Father. Stay in His presence. 1 Samuel 5, verse 1. Now the Philistines had taken the ark of God and they brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashen. And when the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon, 
And when they of Ashad arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of Jehovah. And they took Dagon and set him up in his place again. And when they arose in the, mor- in the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of Jehovah. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands lay cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. God absolutely cut him and cut his tree to pieces. The tree that they had grown, their God that they sat there, they worshipped, all the, the, the nature that they thought that they had into that and all the prayer they, they thought they had into that, God simply just absolutely wiped him, wiped him out and took care of Dagon himself. You see, the Philistines captured the ark, but God can still fight his own battles. And that's who we've got on our side. We've got the Father out there in front of us fighting battles for us with legions of angels that he's assigned to us, fighting, paving ways. Because the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God can defeat absolutely anything. There's nothing that stands in the way, and it's been given to us as proven in the Scriptures that we read about the blessing from Moses. You think Moses just woke up that morning and say, okay, I think I'm going to do this today. No, this was from the Father. And he put that upon the people. And we can partake. You carry the blessing in your everyday life. But God needs you. And God wants you to walk and to be in the image in which you were originally created. Producing the power of the anointing of the God Almighty. The Spirit of God. You see, the Bible provides a number of additional images to help us understand how the Spirit works. The Spirit of God. You see, in John verse 7, Jesus describes the Spirit as a river. Opened up and I went, river. And I went, tree of life. The river. John seven thirty eight and 39. He who believes in me, as the Scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, if we take that, I'm going to build a chain now. If you link John 7 here, to the river of life that's described in Revelation 22, verse 1. I'll read that. And he showed me a pure river of water, of life, as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb of God. The Spirit is the river of living water flowing from Jesus to his people, And then from us, out to the rest of the world. Out to the rest of the world. So that they can feed. Roots feed the tree. And there's all kinds of little small roots that come off of a tree. And they absorb, and they absorb. Every piece of that tree has got an absolute part to play in sustaining every aspect of it right to the leaves that heal the nations. You see, this is the river whose streams make, what? Gladness in our hearts. Gladness in the city of God. Spoke of in Psalms 46. I'm not going to read that. The fountain of life. Again, Psalms 36. It's found in there. But connecting the Spirit to the river of water And you look at how that is poured out upon us as His people. Talks about that in Acts 2, Acts 10, Romans 5, Titus. That God's people are filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. And that we're baptized in the Spirit. Two elements here. Filled and baptized. Just as we're baptized in water, it talks about. Two elements. All taking care of what? 
Adam's displacement. See, Adam wasn't only separated from the, the natural garden again, he was also separated from the dwelling and residing in the spiritual garden of God where God's presence truly dwelt. You see, beyond water, the Scriptures also connect the Spirit to the anointing oil that was used to consecrate priests, kings, and it was poured out upon them. You look at somebody like David. You know, David. The oil was poured on David, and he received the Spirit. Saul anointed him, or Samuel anointed him. Samuel anointed him. And he received the Spirit. Isaiah 61.1. Then we're going to jump over. Now let's read Isaiah 61.1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives and, open, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. But the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. Acts 10, verse 38. Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. It links. It links. You can see Peter talking about it. You can see Isaiah talking about it. Linking that all into what? The Father. Pouring out. Pouring out. Pouring out. And they use that in their description there of Messiah. The Scriptures also link the Spirit like unto a dove. We're going to go for a stretch here. Genesis 1, verse 2. The earth was unformed and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. Hovered. You see, King James says, moved. I saw that and I went, it hovered? It moved? It means to brood, to be relaxed, to flutter, to move, to shake. The Spirit hovers, the Spirit shakes over the water of creation. Hovers what? Say it hovers like a bird. Because we see other examples of that dove that's so spoken of in Scripture. Matthew 3.16 When he had been baptized, what are we talking about here? Water again. Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a, a lightning upon him. The Spirit of God coming down upon him like a dove. Like a dove. John also describes the same thing as a witness. He saw what was going on. He described it the exact same way as a dove. You see, but in Revelation, we go through that and we look at that. Every trace of Adam's sin, every trace of his banishment from the garden, every trace of his trouble, every trace of threat, every trace of temptation, it's all been dealt with. He defeated it all because he understands at this point in time, God understands at this point in time that we can do it. And he knows that he's going to get his people to that point. And that's why he has given us access to the tree of life. But it takes us putting on the work boots. Tying them up. I'm going to wrap up today with this set of scriptures. And I'm not going to say anything more. Daniel 12, verse 3. Daniel 12, verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness. And we're going to go through to the ninth verse. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, 
Shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on its river bank, and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half a time, and when the powers of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I didn't understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Put it all together, people, where we're at. Put it all together where we're at. Put it all together with what that tree of life means in the beginning and what took place in the end and everything in between. We're not done with this topic. I, know, I guarantee you that.